They are the fastest, the largest, and the most dangerous in the world. They conquer every terrain, and they overcome borders. This is a very challenging thing to, um, to bring out a new ship like this. But it is much more than a challenge. It's absolutely a privilege to be here and do this. Their design goes beyond the scope of what is technologically possible, setting new standards. These vehicles are milestones of engineering. This is the father of air travel. On land, on water, and in the air. All of them are ultimate vehicles. In this episode, a jet for around $90 million, the F-35 Lightning II, a bomber with a maximum life expectancy. The B-52 is foreseen to be in service for almost 90 years. A jet to teach American bombers the meaning of fear, the legendary MiG-15. From the same manufacturer, the MiG-29 is for many still the best dogfighting jet in the world. And finally, the most modern military transport aircraft in the world, the A400M. That technology makes it undefeatable in the battle space. It's going to change the way we fight wars. The Lockheed Martin F-35, the most expensive defense project in the world. A fighter jet that almost makes flying child's play, in part because it lets the pilot focus entirely on flying the plane. The F-35 completed its first flight on December the 15th, 2006. It can reach a maximum speed of over 1,900 kilometers per hour. Cost per unit, currently about 94 million US dollars. Phoenix, Arizona. Luke Air Force Base. The largest base for the F-35 is located here, in the American desert. The United States military has ordered a total of 2,400 aircraft for about $400 billion, thus making the jet the most expensive defense project of all time. The home of the 61st Fighter Squadron of the US Air Force. The pilots here are trained to fly one of the mightiest stealth jets in the world. One of them is Major Will Andreotta. He has been flying this technological wonder for three and a half years. Before heading for the aircraft, Major Andreotta puts on vital equipment. Especially important, pressurized trousers. This will allow the blood that basically rushes down from the head to the feet when we pull those high Gs to be pushed back up uh, so we're able to keep consciousness while we're flying. The jet sets new technological limits and pilots are physically at their absolute limit. So we're really well trained, we do this every day. Uh, we take it very seriously, so there's really no nerves whenever we go out there. It's, it's just kind of the, the excitement and the anticipation of accomplishing the mission. One thing left, the helmet. And it is considered the F-35's secret weapon. No one is allowed to examine it closely, but it is designed to make flying far easier. Before takeoff, Major Andreotta gets his flight briefing from the top three of the day. Major Jason Hall. Ready. All right, good morning, lightning flight. Welcome to the step brief. As far as the weather status, we got scattered clouds at 22,000 feet and winds are out of the southwest. They'll be stepping at aircraft 5069 today. There are no previous issues. Don't forget to bring your publications with you and sign out before getting to your jet. Any questions for me? No questions. Bring it on. Now it's time to go. 
the final steps in the air conditioned office before heading out into the blazing Arizona heat, where one of the best fighter jets awaits, but also one of the most controversial. For its horrendous development costs have exposed the project to enormous criticism. The mechanics turn the jet over to Major Andreotta. Good afternoon, sir. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing today? Excellent. Awesome. Are you all ready to fly? Ready. It looks good. In every situation, even in wartime, the procedure is the same. The pilot is always responsible for the final check. This is kind of my last little check just to make sure that all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted, you know, and make sure that, that I'm 100% comfortable when I get into this aircraft. But as I said, these guys, they're professionals. Uh, I have no qualms about, about going into this jet right now. On today's schedule, a formation flight. A formation in which several F-35s fly closely together. No simple exercise, and one that requires a special level of trust among the pilots. Really right now, it's just kind of going to the mode where training takes over everything we've learned, everything we've done for the last, you know, for myself, for three and a half years of flying this F-35 are, are really going to be put into what I do here in the next 45 minutes until we take off. After takeoff, the pilot is supported tremendously by technology during the flight. An innovation from Lockheed Martin, an infrared sensor system. It consists of six infrared cameras placed on the jet so as to cover the entire space around it. They recognize firing anti-aircraft positions, which can then be attacked immediately by weapons available on board. Even fighter jets arriving from any direction are detected. The pilot always knows who is friend and who is foe. A stroke of genius from the designers at Lockheed Martin. Here in Fort Worth, the jet has been in serial production since 2011. Three different versions are built for a total of 11 countries. Charles Bullness is vice president in charge of the F-35 and has been there since the first sketches of the jet were made. One of the biggest challenges is trying to get a 40,000 pound airplane to hover and land vertically. And this is actually the easiest airplane to land. You and I could easily land it and the front wheel of the airplane would land right on the line on a runway. It's that easy. The B variant is the only modern fighter jet that can land vertically. The need for wide open spaces is thus consigned to the past, a milestone for military jets. Be proud of this day, be proud of this moment. The F-35, congratulations! The F-35 has been received with boisterous enthusiasm at all air bases. Another special feature and a groundbreaking innovation, the inside of the helmet, which functions like a virtual reality headset. The helmet that we have on this aircraft, no matter where he looks, he has everything he needs not only to fly the airplane, but to fight with the airplane. With a press of a button, he can look down between his feet, and that camera information is displayed on the visor of his helmet, so he can literally see through the floor of the airplane. One jet is composed of 300,000 individual parts. 1,500 suppliers ensure the highest quality standards. In the American production facility, it takes only a few weeks to assemble the F-35. The cost, about 94 million US dollars. Imperfections are not tolerated. Every time, in every mission, it is ultimately the pilot's safety that is at stake. Early in my career, I started in flight controls. So we learned very early on that you need to make this jet safe every day just to make sure that pilots could always return home to their families. I think this jet is making history. It's the best multi-role fighter in the world. It will be for 50 years. How all the technologies have been integrated to make this jet just an amazing machine is something that makes me very proud every day. Back to Arizona and Luke Air Force Base. Major Andreotta is set to take off momentarily. He is one of 400 fighter pilots from around the world qualified to fly the F-35.
In no time, he brings his jet to over 1,000 kilometers per hour. Years of training in a simulator make the flight a routine job, a job that sometimes includes very special moments. But there are times coming on the way back home or taking off where you just have that second you can just look outside, kind of pinch yourself for you being able to do what you do. Forty-five minutes later, Major Andreotta lands the F-35 safely again on American soil. An everyday task for him in this ultimate vehicle. And yet, each time he gets an adrenaline rush that is familiar to only a few people on Earth. All right, thanks, man. Thank Appreciate you. it. You too, thanks. Everybody that works on this plane, flies the plane, we really have a great sense of pride in, in not only flying the F-35, maintaining the F-35, but also just serving our country and doing something that's bigger than us. So every day, it's a huge honor and privilege to come to work. All in a day's work for man and machine. The Lockheed Martin F-35, a fighter jet that has set a new benchmark for military jets for many years to come. Also in this episode, the legendary MiG-15, which once taught the West the meaning of fear, and the American long-range bomber, the B-52. The F-35 is without a doubt the most modern jet in the world. But in close-range aerial combat, known as dogfighting, many experts believe it is overshadowed by a 40-year-old model. The MiG-29, a flying legend. Yeah, great. This is the best aircraft, so... <laughs> a dreaded hunter of its day. The light fighter interceptor completed its first flight in October 1977. The MiG-29 has a top speed of Mach 2.3. So far, over 1,600 MiG-29s have been produced. Poland, Minsk Mazowiecki, home of the 23rd Air Base. The Polish Air Force has flown the legendary Soviet jet for a good 30 years. The MiG-29's characteristic design includes wings blended to the fuselage and leading edge root extensions, a construction that facilitates high speeds as well as outstanding maneuverability at subsonic speeds. Its unique agility makes the MiG-29 nearly unbeatable in a dogfight. Today, trainer Rafal is taking his student, Mikolai, on a training flight with a MiG-29, in which they will run through various aerial maneuvers. Before going up in the air, Mikolai, the trainee pilot, must first practice in a simulator. I am just at the beginning of my training, so for me, uh it's not that complicated, but it's uh, it's a bit difficult for me now, so I will do my best. Today's training is about air policing, which means to identify unknown aircraft and to react in a flash. In the simulator, the trainers confront Mikolai with situations that he will also have to deal with immediately once he gets up in the air. In the meantime, mechanics prepare the aircraft for the pilots. They check all the systems again. In an airplane made of six million individual parts, many things can go wrong.
Thus, the MiGs come here regularly for maintenance. Martin is the head of the maintenance crew and is responsible for the squadron's total of 16 MiGs. This plane is a legend now because in those years when this plane was appear, it was, I think, absolutely the most powerful uh, and most dangerous plane on over the world. His radio electronics elements, uh, radio station, um, radar and uh, the armament system, they're very, very uh, advanced and sophisticated. The MiG-29 went into serial production in 1982. In its early years, it was a dreaded unknown for the West. Only in 1988 at the Farnborough Air Airshow did representatives of NATO countries get a closer look at the MiG-29. They were amazed at its extraordinary aerial capabilities. Now they are 27 years old. The Polish Air Force plans to use these planes during the next 13 years. For agility and speed, the MiG-29 is still tough to beat. How to deploy these features ideally for air policing is what Rafael and Mikolai will be practicing in a 45-minute training flight. It's very fun. It has some capabilities that are unique for the aircraft, like aerodynamics and thrust weight ratio. And it's sometimes very difficult, so we have to be on your foot, on your feet, sorry. During the exterior inspection, Rafael also checks the huge air intakes. For takeoff, they are automatically closed with flaps so that no dirt gets into the highly sensitive engines. Then air enters through intakes on the wings, a unique design. Rafael and Mikolai start their jets' powerful engines and taxi slowly to the runway. In a real air policing mission, pilots must be in the air no later than 15 minutes after getting the alert. Like most Russian fighter jets, the MiG-29 has an especially robust undercarriage, so that it can also take off from provisional airstrips. Pilots need only 270 meters of runway for takeoff, and in less than a minute, they can reach an altitude of 10,000 meters. This performance is possible thanks to the Klimov RD-33 engines, developed specially for the MiG-29. They are mounted underneath the fuselage in separate pods. This position ensures that enough air gets into the engines during extreme maneuvers, such as sharp curves and steep angles of attack. Only with sufficient air intake can the engines perform optimally. In relation to the aircraft's weight, the engines are so powerful that the MiG-29 can ascend vertically like a rocket, and it almost reaches the speed of sound in vertical flight. Speed and agility were always its obvious advantages. Disadvantages were the short range due to small tanks and the small range of its infrared targeting system. For the MiG-29 was originally designed only for short range air defense. If pilots embroiled their adversary in a dogfight, they were almost invincible. After three quarters of an hour, Rafael and Mikolai returned from their training flight. The plane lands at a speed of 250 kilometers an hour. Using air brakes and a brake chute, the MiG-29 only needs a runway 750 meters long. The air intakes are closed again for landing. Mikolai has just finished a grueling training session. He had, of course, practiced the maneuvers in the simulator ahead of time. But it all feels very different at an altitude of over 10,000 meters and speeds near the sound barrier. 
Eh, that was fun. I hope I was, I was better than in the simulator, than the simulator, yeah? <laughs> but we will see. What matters is the opinion of his trainer, Rafael. He, we, did, uh, we accomplished everything we briefed, so I'm happy about this. We have some minor stuff to discuss, but most of all was fine. So I'm happy for this fight. And of course with his plane, the legendary MiG-29. Later in this episode, a flying fortress, the American B-52 Stratofortress bomber. Its combination of payload, range and speed has never been surpassed. The foundation for the MiG-29's extraordinary aerial features was laid by another legend. This fighter was the Soviet Union's first mass-produced jet aircraft, and it shocked the West in the Korean War, the MiG-15. Very robust, well-armed, and extremely agile and fast. The MiG-15 completed its first flight in December 1947. Its job, to attack and intercept heavy bombers as an agile fighter. Its top speed is just under the sound barrier. In total, more than 13,000 of this airplane were produced. The Czech Republic, Haradek Kralove, a one-hour drive from Prague. Here, at a former military airfield, is one of only 12 airworthy MiG-15s in the world, a MiG-15 UTI. With a height of 3.7 meters, a wingspan of 10 meters, and a weight of three tons, the MiG-15 is a small and extremely agile airplane with a powerful engine. The MiG-15 was presented to the public for the first time on July the 17th, 1949, at a Russian air display in Tushino. One year later, in the Korean War, it shocked the Americans who until then had enjoyed unchallenged air superiority. In countless aerial battles, Russian pilots taught their adversaries to fear them. Only one American plane, the F-86 Sabre, could take on the MiG-15. This airplane still has many fans, such as Roman Svoboda and Joseph Miraki, the owners of the Czech MiG-15. For them, the old-timer is something very special. This plane is a childhood dream come true. I remember the first time I saw the plane. I was six or seven and lived only 40 kilometers from a military airfield. The planes flew over us constantly. I knew then that one day I would own this plane. The two men bought their MiG-15 from an American museum in 2013. It took more than a year after transporting the plane to rebuild it and make it airworthy. This airplane and all its parts are 62 years old, so it's complicated. Luckily, we have original blueprints and were able to recreate some parts, which was especially important for the motor. Since then, they have been presenting their MiG-15 at air shows all over Europe, and they let passengers fly with them in the legendary fighter jet. Gregory Alexatos from Berlin booked such a flight. The 20-minute experience costs the airplane enthusiast about 3,000 euros. You're flying a piece of history. Built in 55, you have to have tried it. It's going to rock. But first, the MiG-15 must be refueled. Its tank holds 900 liters. It can be doubled with drop tanks. 
In the meantime, Roman, the plane's other owner and the pilot of the MiG-15, goes through a short briefing with his guest. Roman is a former military and test pilot and has experience with a wide variety of fighter jets. But in his view, no other plane can compete with the MiG-15. It's classic flying, really. It's very easy. The only time you actually have to pay attention would be during landing, since the nose is close to the ground. Apart from that, it's, it's a fast plane. You can do a lot of Gs with it. I'm used to flying fast planes. And for pilots like myself, this is an easy thing to do. It's child's play, really. No wonder the MiG-15 was the most widely built fighter plane with jet propulsion. Little by little, Gregory is getting nervous for his flight. You can't let fear get the better of you. Just embrace the fear and pack it away for 20 minutes. Then Roman starts the MiG-15's engine. It was originally designed by Rolls-Royce in England and was built in Russia under license. It is almost twice as powerful as most other engines from the late 1940s. The MiG-15 needs less than 700 meters for takeoff. Its undercarriage is extremely sturdy. Thus, the MiG-15 could also operate from unpaved advanced airfields. Right after takeoff, Roman demonstrates for his passenger what made the MiG-15 so legendary and dangerous. Thanks to its sturdy semi-monocoque construction, it can withstand up to 8 Gs of force and thus engage in extreme aerial maneuvers. In comparison, today's fighter jets can only manage 1 or 2 Gs more. Pilots in the Korean War also took advantage of these features. How, how fast can we fly? Uh, eight and uh, nine hundred kilometers per hour. Even at low altitude, the MiG-15 flies close to the sound barrier as Roman demonstrates with this maneuver, called a low pass. That the MiG-15 can fly so fast and remain controllable is due to its wing shape, which was innovative at the time of its development. In contrast to early airplanes, whose wings were at a right angle to the fuselage, the MiG-15's wings are angled backwards 35 degrees. It is only these so-called swept wings that make it possible to fly close to the sound barrier. For near the sound barrier, drag is higher. Thanks to its aerodynamic form, the swept wings offsets this drag. In addition, the MiG-15's wings are angled about two degrees downward. This slight tilt improves the airplane's agility. Thus, the MiG-15 swept wings make it one of the best and most dangerous fighter jets of its time. The 20 minutes are over. Roman begins his approach. To keep the landing run as short as possible, the MiG-15's engineers give it extra large brake flaps. Gregory has survived 20 minutes of high G-force. He looks happy, but also somewhat worn out. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Everyone should try it. Of course, the MiG-15 is a classic among military aircraft. Also in this episode, the A400M. For a propeller plane of its mass, it can fly unusually fast and high, but also slow and low. That makes it extremely versatile. The MiG-15 was designed above all to intercept heavy bombers.
It was a legend of the Cold War. And one day, it would be the world's oldest military aircraft in active service. The range with the B-52 is pretty much unlimited. Even now, it is considered a jack of all trades. It is one of the most versatile aircraft ever designed. Despite its advanced age, it is the backbone of the US Air Force. The B-52's first flight took place on April 15, 1952. The heavy bomber has a range of over 14,000 kilometers at a maximum gross weight of 220 tons. Bossier City, Louisiana, Barksdale Air Force Base, the largest B-52 base in the United States. Originally, the B-52 was developed as a nuclear deterrent in the Cold War. The Americans wanted to be able to use the high-flying bomber to fly atomic bombs into Russian airspace, undetected by Russian radar. Armed with conventional weapons, B-52s continue to be used today. Headquarters of the 20th Bomb Squadron. The men stationed here are trained to fly one of the most legendary bombers in history. Captain Joseph Okai and his crew are preparing for a training mission. A standard B-52 crew is composed of five people. The minimum crew is three. The equipment check is essential. So what we're doing here is, uh, before every mission, you want to come in here and check your equipment out. Aircrew flight equipment does a good job of pre-flighting your helmets for you as far as uh, making sure the right equipment uh, with the right mic uh, and uh, audio. You want to do all this now so you don't have to worry about anything once you get to the jet and you're really, like, you're good to go uh, for the mission itself. Before the crew goes on board, they are briefed on current weather conditions. see what kind of turbulence or uh, weather we have on the AR track to see uh, what to expect basically when we get out there. Of the 75 B-52s currently fit for service, 47 are located here at Barksdale Air Force Base. After a flight, a B-52 must be serviced for 20 hours before it can take off again. Nicholas Kupfala is responsible for the B-52's laborious maintenance. Even he is amazed by the aged bomber's capabilities. It can land in crosswind, uh, crosswinds, which is pretty crazy. Like, if you ever see it, it'll land. The nose would be like toward an angle, and the gear would be straight. So it can land in crosswinds. What makes this special feature possible? The undercarriage. In a crosswind landing, the pilot can angle the undercarriage up to 20 degrees to the left or right. The wheels come down straight on the runway, whereas the aircraft is at a 20 degree angle, facing into the wind. Well, a lot of 12 hour shifts, but you know, it's worth it in the end, just being able to see something like this that's been flying for over 60 years. The U.S. military plans to use the aircraft, last built in 1962, until 2040, making it the world's oldest combat aircraft in service. Uh, once we start the engines, just let me know what the engines are doing, any torching, anything that's going on with them. Uh, make sure the 747 section is locked up. Anything to tell me about the jet? Yes, sir. Alright, man. Appreciate it. We'll do our walk around. Thank you, sir. At 48 and a half meters, it is quite long. With its payload of 31 and a half tons, its wingspan of 56.4 meters, and its enormous range, the design was a technical masterstroke. The last check is always made by the pilot and his crew. And still, technical problems cropped up in the past during the flight. Uh, sorry, we're the left tip gear refused to come down. We went around a little bit till we lost some fuel, so, so we got a little lighter so we can land. And uh, came back and landed with uh, one gear still up. So that was, you know, my first time that happened, it was kind of like, oh, you know, still nerve wracking, if you will, but I was with a very experienced uh, aircraft pilot and he was fine to go. With eight turbines and fuel tanks, 
The wings are so heavy that outrigger wheels are necessary to support them. Once everyone comes together, you know the jet's ready to go. You guys can take off. So we did all the mission planning. We got everything done. And uh, you know, after a long day of briefings and all kinds of stuff, now we get to go up there and actually make the mission happen. So this is the best part. All right, guys, ready? let's do it. Each one of the eight jet engines has 13 and a half tons of thrust. This enormous power is necessary for the bomber's huge wingspan and its maximum weight of 220 tons. Its size and its supposedly ugly appearance have given the B-52 the nickname Buff, Big Ugly Fat Fellow. The construction of a bomber with this range and payload was an engineering milestone. Historian Sean Bohannon is an expert in the history of the bomber. At the end of the Second World War, the United States realized that it might not have a forward base available in the next war for its strategic bomber force. So that became an imperative. An aircraft that was able to operate from the continental United States and strike any target in the world. With its payload of 31 and a half tons, the B-52 is able to transport the largest array of weapons in the entire U.S. arsenal. With this B-52D Strata Fortress here, this is a prime example of how reliable uh, and sound this aircraft was. This particular model flew 145 combat missions in Southeast Asia. Most of these were anywhere from uh, 12 to 16 hour long missions. During the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, the B-52 bomber flew an average of about 70 missions a day. During the Vietnam War, a total of 126,000 missions. Such long-range missions are only possible with several air refuelings. The tank can take up to about 142 tons of kerosene. It is also the only aircraft in the U.S. Air Force that can carry both internal and external weapons. Continual upgrades ensure the Strato Fortress's versatility. The B-52 uses three different braking systems. In addition to air brakes and brake flaps on the wings, it uses a brake parachute that helps to halt its enormous weight. Unique among aircraft of this size. After every flight, the crew reflects on how future missions could be improved. It's great, you know? After all that, going up there and flying it, always being the Jets, always a good day, you know? Sorry about the loud noise. But yeah, coming back down, we have a lot of things to talk about in debrief. Uh, it was a great sortie, but we have some stuff we're going to improve on, so we'll go back and talk about it in the, in the squadron and uh, make sure we can improve ourselves for the next time we fly. The B-52, despite its advanced age, it still induces awe. The last ultimate vehicle is another heavyweight of troop deployment. It is the most modern military transport aircraft in the world, the Airbus A400M. Designed for use as a tactical and strategic transporter, it has extraordinary features for an aircraft of its size. The Airbus A400M's maiden flight was on the 11th of December 2009. 
It can fly almost 9,000 kilometers at a stretch and has a maximum load capacity of 37 tons. Wunsdorf Air Base near Hanover. The German A400M aircraft are stationed here as part of Air Transport Wing 62. One of the planes is now returning from Emari Air Base in Estonia. In only one week, several hundred tons of material and equipment must be flown from the NATO base there back to Germany. The A400M, which was commissioned as a joint European project in 2000, has been used by the Bundeswehr since the end of 2014. It provides nearly twice as much space as its predecessor in the Luftwaffe, the Transall. The A400M's four turboprop engines are among the biggest in the world. Their eight-bladed propellers have a diameter of over five meters. As soon as the aircraft stops moving, work begins for Sergeant Major Andreas, the loadmaster. He is responsible for the cargo hold as well as for loading and unloading. Here we see the supports, which keep the aircraft from tipping during loading. Then we'll unload the container. We've got to stay on time. The crew has to complete a total of three missions today from Emari. In less than an hour, the A400M is supposed to be back in the air. The containers are secured on the ground with a newly developed locking system. In only one minute, the crew has unlocked the cargo. Then, they can roll the five-ton container onto the transport vehicle. The locking system saves a lot of time. It goes much faster. We're talking about 15 or 20 minutes that can easily be saved during loading or unloading. As soon as the 340 cubic meter cargo hold is empty, preparations begin for the return flight to Estonia. In the cockpit, Captain Henning, the pilot, checks the data for the pending flight. He and his colleague Kai are among the first pilots who were trained for the A400M. This is one of the most modern cockpits in the world, and the most modern among military cockpits, based on the A380 cockpit. It has multiple display. We can display all the data necessary to fulfill our mission. A great plane, perfect for the military. Furthermore, all the systems are multiply redundant, thus ensuring the greatest possible safety. Now the preparations for takeoff are finished. Fully loaded and refueled, the A400M weighs 141 tons. That it only needs 1,000 meters for takeoff despite this weight is extremely important for tactical missions in the field. On such missions, only very short, makeshift runways are generally available. The flight to Emari lasts two and a half hours. For the loadmaster, time for a breather. The A400M's cargo hold is a pressurized cabin, like in a passenger airplane. The cruising altitude of 11,000 meters is reached in a few minutes. Flying with a turboprop at 33,000 feet is just phenomenal. And a speed of Mach 0.68. That's about 400 knots ground speed we're doing. That makes it possible to fly this route several times today. The A400M can reach a maximum altitude of 12,300 meters, higher than any other propeller plane. This is made possible by the four extremely powerful turboprop engines. They were designed specifically for the A400M. The special thing, the propellers turn in opposite directions. This concentrates the airstream at the middle of the wing, ensuring greater lift and better lateral stability. What this does for flight performance is demonstrated rather impressively by this Airbus pilot at an air show. Still, it takes quite a lot of practice to perform aerobatic maneuvers with an 80-ton transport aircraft, such as this so-called inside loop.
Wunsdorf Air Base has simulators to train pilots and cargo crew. One is the so-called cargo trainer. It is a one-to-one -one reproduction of the A400M's fuselage. In addition to Bundeswehr soldiers, those of other nations' militaries train here as well. Today's program includes an exercise in which the cargo hold is converted for passenger transport. The goal, to retrofit the aircraft for the maximum number of 116 seats within one hour. Heiko Westermann is an aeronautical engineer and oversees the A400M's introduction into the Bundeswehr. The A400M's delivery has been delayed, but for training purposes we can use simulators. For example, this cargo hold trainer where we are now. The maiden flight itself took place almost a year later than planned. The delivery of a total of 174 aircraft to the eight purchasing nations has been delayed by more than three years. Problems with the aircraft's parts crop up time and again, such as the newly developed engines and the self-protection measures. The A400M has already proven itself for air transport, especially with regard to range and payload. Its tactical features still present a challenge to the manufacturer. Once these challenges are overcome, the airplane will be unique for its flexibility. For the A400M can be deployed everywhere in the world. Snow and ice affect the aircraft as little as heat and dusty gravel runways. The A400M can be refueled in mid-air and it can also be used as a tanker to refuel other airplanes. Furthermore, it can fly so slow and low that paratroopers and loads can be dropped. And for tactical deployment in war zones, the A400M has decoy flares and various electronic self-protection measures on board. Meanwhile, the Bundeswehr aircraft has almost reached its destination, the NATO base in Estonia. Captain Henning, the pilot, prepares the approach. We have calculated the landing run. The runway is three kilometers long. We need about 1,000 meters to land. In an emergency, a landing run of only 625 meters would suffice for the A400M. For eight months, the Bundeswehr has secured the airspace over the Baltic states from Amari. Now other nations will take over the job. Before loading, Sergeant Major Andreas, the loadmaster, checks whether the container is evenly packed and nothing can slide around during the flight. The colleagues on site have done good work though, and after 20 minutes, the two containers are loaded and secured. Loading went great. We'll stow the rest properly, wait for the passengers, and then it's time to go. We'll close up here in a minute, and then we're ready for takeoff. Fully loaded, the A400M sets off for the return flight to Germany. And in about five hours, the most modern transport aircraft in the world will land for the third time today, here in Emari. <laughs>